you know, what are the Chinese doing? They're not going to use it to back um, their own currency uh, because that would limit what they do with their own currency. But it is an insurance policy against a collapsing dollar. They're insulating themselves against the collapse of capitalism. I mean, there are good reasons they're buying gold, yes. Um, and uh, it's, if you like, an escape from the dollar, which I think is is probably the most important point. But uh, the, the, the Chinese situation is interesting because um, you, you have to go back to when the People's Bank of China, the state bank, um, the state central bank was first appointed uh, the monopoly of gold and silver dealing. And that was way back in 1983. So we're talking about something which is, you know, 38 years ago now. Now, what happened was that um, no um, resident in China was allowed to hold gold at all, or silver for that matter. So um, uh, the during the time between then and when they were permitted, which was 2002, which was when the Shanghai Gold Exchange was founded, it's quite clear that the state accumulated a pile of gold, in particular, we'll talk about gold rather than silver. Um, and um, it did this, right, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, other, others have done this in the past. I mean, I go back to um, uh, the Arabs uh, in the 1970s. Um, you know, when uh, uh, Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard completely, um, effectively, he and Kissinger said to the Arabs, look, you know, we can't stop you charging what you like for your oil. But the one thing we're going to insist on is that um, it's priced in dollars and that you run your surpluses in, um, in dollars through our banking system. And of course, that money was then lent for political reasons to Latin America and all disappeared, basically. <laughs> then you had the Brady bonds to try and rescue the whole thing and all the rest of it. Another example was Germany after the First World War. Sorry, Second World War. Um, uh, you know, when Germany's economy uh, began to recover and really build and got going nicely, um, it started, you know, buying gold. It put dollars into gold you know, sort of substantially held in at the New York Fed. The Arabs were doing the same thing. I didn't quite finish that story. But, you know, for an Arab, they were looking at, I mean, as far as they were concerned, and we're talking about Bedouin stock, basically, you know, what is property? It's not money, as far as they're concerned. It's gold. Gold is so much in their psyche. Um, so they were putting a figure like 10, maybe 15% of what they were earning from oil revenues into gold. Um, and uh, China had exactly the same view. It did not want to have just dollars because it knew that dollars could go to nothing and they would have no control over it. So what do you do? You have some insurance against it. And so between 1983 and 2002, the People's Bank of China accumulated huge quantities of gold. Now, I know this um, basically from the way the regulations uh, um, uh, appointing them were, were written. We also know this because China invested an awful lot of money into gold mines and became the largest producer in the world in short order. We know this because the state still controls and runs completely all the refining, gold refining um, industry in China. And furthermore, imports Dore from other countries. We also know this, that no gold leaves China at all. So, you know, is this a, you know, do they like gold? Like hell they do. They really love it. I mean, it's quite clear. So, um, and also anecdotal evidence, um, you know, through contacts, um, you know, they tell me that uh, uh, this has been distributed around various accounts. For example, the people, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, has stacks of it in, in warehouses. The Communist Party account has stacks of it and all the rest of it. None of this is appearing really in uh, the official reserves. So they've got loads of it. And the answer I think is, they're not going to use it to back um, their own currency uh, because that would limit what they do with their own currency. But it is an insurance policy against a collapsing dollar. They are printing dollars, they are printing euros, they are printing pounds, they're printing yen to keep stock markets high and to keep them bubbling. 
And at some stage, this is going to go wrong. Now, this is where we start talking about the effect of inflation, because the effect of inflation, monetary inflation, is to drive up prices, which drives down the purchasing power of these currencies. So they're already weakening. And as soon as you recognize that point, you begin to recognize that the only thing that can happen from here is that interest rates reflecting the time preference on these fiat currencies have got to go up. What's that going to do to the stock market bubble? I mean, you don't need to, you know, this is not a this is not a difficult one to see. It's going to pop the bubble. And I would reckon that the way um, prices are going through, um, <clears throat> the way they're increasing, the way the, the Fed and other central banks are sitting there saying, this is transitory, this is transitory. They know damn well it's not transitory. They're just whistling, hoping that something will turn up. It won't. They will have to put up interest rates probably at the end of the summer. And when they do that, the bubble pops. What do they do then? Um, do they uh, taper or to try and make things look better? No, like hell they do. What they do is they increase the rate of quantitative easing because what they want to do is to keep the bubble going. So they've got to have to up it from 120 billion to, I don't know, 200 billion a month. 250 billion a month, whatever. So they're destroying the currency to keep the bubble going. And you must uh, remember that um, Marxist universities, where all these guys learn their economics, um, the number one thing that they say, which is something that Marx said, and that is that capitalism destroys itself and their currencies with it. And basically, once you get into that sort of situation, um, when you're bubble, your share bubble starts popping, then at that stage, it takes the currency down with it. And that's exactly what happened in France. But what alternative have they got? Do they just stand back and let it all fall down? They don't have a mandate to do that. And that's the important point. So we are stuck in this situation where there is only one outcome, and that outcome is rapidly approaching. And you know what are the Chinese doing? They're insulating themselves against the collapse of capitalism.